Is it happening? <laughs> is our long national nightmare over? Is John Angelos really selling the Orioles? Is it happening? Is it happening? We'll talk about it on a special live episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Tuesday, January 30th, 2024, and it could go down as a very important day in Orioles history. This is the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And as always, I am your host, Connor Newcomb. And you may have noticed, well, Connor, you already put out an episode on Tuesday. You talked about Danny Coulomb getting a club option for 2025. And Aaron Hicks and Adam Frazier leaving the Orioles to sign elsewhere. You already did an episode today. Why are you back? Well, we got news that is way, way better than all that other stuff. And while it has not been totally and completely confirmed yet, we've got two sources that I trust that are on the news. Number one is John O'Rand, previously of the Sports Business Journal, now of the news site Puck Sports, which covers all things sports media. He's one of the best in the business covering sports media. And the other happens to be Andy Casca, my former college classmate, and the Orioles reporter at the Baltimore Banner. And oh yeah, they are reporting that John Angelos is selling the Baltimore Orioles to a group led by David Rubenstein, the billionaire, and many others for an approximate $1.725 billion. Now where I want to start here is before we go crazy, what we know. So here is what we know. Let's start there because there's a lot of speculation, as you would expect at this point. But here's what we know. Again, John O'Rand, one of the most trusted sources in sports media. Not only that, but a Maryland native and an Orioles fan, which always helps right there. He is reporting that John Angelos has agreed to sell the team, sell the franchise to a group of people led by two billionaires. Now, the first one is David Rubenstein. And if you remember... About a month or so back, there were reports coming out that David Rubenstein was in talks to try and acquire the Orioles. And there's been reports about him for a while now. Now, he does currently reside in D.C., but was born and raised in Baltimore, has been an Orioles fan, and is worth somewhere between 4 and $5 billion. That's more than double what the Angeloses are worth in his net worth. Now, Made a lot of his money by starting the Carlisle Group back in the late 1980s. That is a private equity firm. What we know is a lot of private equity firms do a lot of bad things to businesses. They come in, they buy them, they strip them for parts, they fire people, and they sell them away for the highest profit. Now, I get that that's bad. However, the Orioles are not being sold to the Carlisle Group, the private equity firm. Rubenstein actually stepped down as CEO of the Carlisle Group about six or seven years ago. He's still somewhat involved, but not nearly as much as he was. And it's not being sold to the group. It's being sold to him as the main controlling partner, it would seem. So why that's a good thing is you would hope he's not going to operate the Orioles like a private equity firm. And the other thing where people are saying, oh, the private equity firm, it's going to be even worse. I'm not sure it can get even worse than John Angelos. I'm not sure that the pay payroll can be, quote, stripped down any more than it currently is as the Orioles won 101 games and are planning on running the 28th highest payroll in Major League Baseball. Don't think it's going to get much worse than that. David Rubenstein, however, is worth almost $5 billion, and he likes to spend his money, which is a good thing as well. And Rubenstein, not only does he like to spend his money on, you know, cars or houses or whatever billionaires are generally spending their money on. He was one of the first billionaires back in 2010 to sign on to the giving pledge, which was a pledge led by Bill Gates and others for basically millionaires and billionaires around the world to pledge to give away more of their fortunes before they died. And Rubenstein was one of the first ones to do it. And he's one of the ones who has spent the most money in that pledge. The big thing for David Rubenstein is basically, I think they call it patriotic giving something like that where he gives a lot of his money to like keep the monuments going in dc and the upkeep on the museums and he donated 15 million dollars a few years ago just to help with the restoration of the washington monument this is a dude who paid an absurd amount of money to get a copy of the magna carta and then donate it to a museum where he felt it should be now i know my general stance is all billionaires are bad 
And guess what? This is not changing that general stance. But it can't get much worse than John Angelos. And here's the thing. And I saw somebody put this perfectly on Twitter, which I did jump back on fully for the first time in about three months here on Tuesday night. There is no one who has the money to buy a big-time professional sports organization like the Orioles are who is going to be an across-the-board good person. That's just not how we live our lives here in capitalism. However, if you're going to establish that all these people are generally going to be bad in some way, just hope that they will spend their money because guess what? If they spend their money on the team, they say, I don't care about making giant profits. I want to win. I want to spend. I want this to be my passion project. That is what you want. I understand that the Mets had a bad year, but the influx of Steve Cohen owning the Mets was just throwing money and money and more money. He's one of the richest people in the world. And now hopefully he'll get the right people involved to run the Mets with David Stearns. The Orioles already have those right people. They were running the 29th payroll in baseball last year, and they won 101 games, the most wins in the American League with Mike Elias and his crew doing a lot of smart things to build this organization up. Now imagine Mike Elias and crew plus a large influx in cash. And that's not just spending on free agents and extensions and being able to make the trades you want to make. That is also doing things like upgrading anything you want in player development, giving better facilities in the minor leagues, better facilities at the stadium for the major league players, higher salaries, happier employees who perform better across the board in the organization, you would hope that all of those things are going to happen. Now, there's no guarantee that happens. And there is a chance that from a private equity background, someone could come in and continue to just strip the Orioles for parts. But this is a Maryland native in David Rubenstein who is 74 years old and he just stepped down from basically overseeing the Kennedy Center earlier on Tuesday. He's already stepped away from that main gig at the Carlisle Group. Most of what he does now is host to podcasts and YouTube shows talking about finances and different things that people do with their money. It would seem to me he's looking for this late-in-life passion project. He's an Orioles fan. It feels like, and this could be wrong, but what it feels like he wants to bring winning back to Baltimore and infuse some money into this franchise. And if it means John Angelos is going to pocket almost $2 billion, I don't really care. Get this guy out of here. So that is the big thing what we know with David Rubenside. We also know that it's Mike Arrighetti would kind of be the number two person here. He is a New York native, or at least lives in New York, Aries Management Corporation. He is the co-founder there. Kind of similar to Rubenstein, has a lot of money and might be stepping into this. Now, Andy Koska from the Baltimore Banner also ended up tweeting out some more context, at least at this point, to the deal. And from Andy's tweet, we learned that the ownership groups includes Mike Arrighetti and David Rubenstein, but also Maryland leaders, philanthropists, and sports legends as well, which is what generally happens with these ownership groups. It's it's honestly what's going on with the Orioles right now. I mean, they have a bunch of smaller, pe not smaller people, but people with a little less money than the Angelos's who have, you know, 1%, 0.5%, 2% ownership stake in the team at this point. And that's how most of these ownership group goes. But when, you know, maybe 0.1% goes to Cal Ripken Jr., and, you know, maybe a little bit of percent percentage goes here and there. Maybe Joan Jett gets a little bit of money to be in the ownership group. Like, these are some of the cool things that can go along with this. Now, other important things to know. A big question is, is Masson involved? And what does this mean for Masson? That we don't know about yet. Another big thing that we do know is that getting that lease signed for, we know, at least 15 years and most likely at least for another 30 years that the Orioles signed at the end of December, that is a pretty big part of this because something that even if, you know, the, the, the best person, you know, comes in and buys your team and you're thinking they're going to spend, it's going to be awesome. There's always the worries, even if it's David Rubenstein, who is a Maryland native and grew up in Baltimore as an Orioles fan, there's always that small worry of, are they going to pick up and move the team? Because they're going to want to do things their way. 
Well, the fact that he's from Baltimore certainly helps that not be the case. The fact that he still lives in the area helps that not be the case. And also the fact that the team literally just weeks ago signed a new 30-year lease to stay in Baltimore and stay at Oriole Park at Camden Yards, I think can ease some of those worries as well. I think that is actually really a huge part of this where the number one worry is, are they going to do something just incredibly different? I think we can back off from that. So that's what really across the board, we know right now. We know it's not finalized and things are going to have to happen. The owners meet in Orlando next week for their owners meetings. Hopefully this can start to get the ball rolling and they can have the vote then to approve these new owners. But I would think someone who's from Baltimore and is worth almost $5 billion in David Rubenstein as the point person for this ownership group, probably a pretty easy approval for all the other owners to say yes. And I'll tell you one thing. If the other owners aren't stepping in to get John Fisher out of Oakland, they kind of don't really care who's owning the team as long as it's a rich guy who they can hang out with. And David Rubenstein's a rich guy. So you know what? They're probably going to say yes to that. So that is what we know right now. At this point, about 7.30 p.m. Eastern time on Tuesday, January 30th. We know things can change, but that is what we know. Beyond that, though, we can wildly speculate. And maybe we're not going to do that. But let's talk about what's next. That is coming up next. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by Factor. Get started on your New Year's resolutions with Factor so you're ready for the new year. Factor's ready-to-eat meal delivery takes the stress out of meal planning and sets you up for success in the new year. Skip the grocery stores, the prep work, and cooking fatigue. Instead, get chef crafted dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door. With over 35 meals to choose from per week, including options like keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more, plus over 55 weekly add-ons, you'll have a ton of nutritious and flavorful options to kickstart your resolutions. So head to factormeals.com slash locked on MLB 50 and use code locked on MLB 50 to get 50% off. If you want to have a celebratory meal, maybe you have it from Factor. That's code locked on MLB 50 at factormeals.com slash locked on MLB 50 to get 50% off. It's a celebration here. Sadly, didn't have any champagne in the new house to pop the champagne for the report. First by John O'Ran of Puck Sports, Andy Costco of the Baltimore Banner jumping in that John Angelos is selling the Baltimore Orioles to a group led by David Rubenstein, a local billionaire, for about $1.725 billion, that is billion with a B, billion dollars. And here's the other thing. This is um, this is just exciting for us, the fans. Let's take a second here to realize what this could mean. Even if Rubenstein doesn't invest hundreds of millions of dollars into the payroll and say, we're getting everybody and jump in and say, next best pitcher on the market next offseason, he's ours. We're doing whatever it takes. We got to the point where it felt like it couldn't be any worse than John Angelos. I mean, and let me know in the comments if you feel the same. Like, I understand some of the pushback and some of the worries. You know, it's a private equity guy. You know, these billionaires are bad. Is he really going to have the Orioles' best interests? Is he going to try to meddle more in the baseball operations like Peter Angelos used to do? Or is he just going to let Mike Elias do his thing, which has worked out for a while now? I get all of that. But understand how bad it was under John Angelos. He's talking to the New York Times last year, complaining about how, oh, if we extend even one guy, you know, one of our stars to an extension, we're going to go financially underwater. He's screaming at Dan Connolly about asking him about the financials of the Orioles, saying Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wouldn't like that on his day. He's telling you, oh, we're going to open the books multiple times and never, ever does it. He's suspending the beloved Kevin Brown the beloved Kevin Brown for stating a fact on the air. He had no, just was not in touch with reality at all. And despite being worth multiple billion dollars was not spending on this team 
at all. Again, 28th payroll for a team that just won 101 games. You can't be doing that if you want to sustain that level of success, or at the very least, keep Adley, Gunner, Grayson, Bradish, all these guys around. David Rubenstein has the money to keep those guys around. But it's really just a I felt a sigh of relief. I mean, yes, I celebrate it, right? When I see the John O'Ran report, of course I celebrate. But I also take a deep breath and it feels like the O's can just be better, obviously. They can spend more money. They can add players at a higher rate. Everything could get better. But also it's just like not having to deal with John Angelos anymore. And I understand that I've made John Angelos my own problem a lot. And I've probably talked about John Angelos and complained about John Angelos more than any other Orioles podcaster. There are some writers out there that have given him the business. Shout out to Nathan Ruiz, who has moved on from writing about the Orioles. We will miss his coverage, but he provided some great John Angelos snark and was a guest of this podcast as well. But I, I feel like we can just move on. And it is a little weird that David Rubenstein is is so front facing, right? He's got like multiple podcasts. He he he's very out in the open, and you, you know the things that he says. And as a guy's worth five billion dollars, I'm sure not all those things might be great all the time. And maybe we'll get some pushback there. But if he is spending on players and helping the Orioles win, and if the Orioles win a World Series under David Rubenstein, things will be forgotten, and it's going to be so so much better than what it was with John Angelos. And we've now got, you know, the Baltimore banner, the Baltimore Sun, on top of this report from John O'Ran for Puck Sports. Again, John Angelos reportedly selling the Orioles to a group led by David Rubenstein for approximately $1.725 billion. Shout out to Maryland native and an O's fan and John O'Ran for breaking the story. One of the top people out there covering sports business. He used to work at Sports Business Journal. He moved to the new site, Puck Sports, about a month ago. I was a little wary, like, wait, where did John O'Ran go? But he's a respectable journalist. We've got multiple respectable journalists on the story. It seems like this is something that's happening right now, that that, that is truly, truly happening. And so, you know, we do have to wait on a lot of this. And here's why I want to, I don't want to rain on anyone's parade, but I want to pump the brakes a little bit. Because even if this all goes perfectly, it's not like David Rubenstein's going to step in tomorrow, right, and take over the team. You know, I see, I, I see the comment right here, uh, time to sign, to sign Snell, let's go. Totally on board with this comment right here from B-Man. However, again, Rubenstein's not going to have any power for the rest of this offseason, even if it goes perfectly. So anything you're looking to do this offseason is probably still off the table at this point. However. This sale, if all goes well, at some point during the 2024 season, things are going to happen. And luckily, a sale like this, it's not like it affects too much on the field if it like happens in May or June, right, while the season's going on. I don't think it impacts too, too much of that. The the, the payroll's already set. You got things moving in motion. You've got all your people, Mike Elias and his staff in place. Like you, You've got things happening even if it takes a while. But the hope would be is that if Rubenstein takes over at some point in 2024, he's in charge when the next offseason starts. And the Orioles could still win a World Series this year. They've got the talent to go do things. But whether they would win it or not, next offseason, it begins. It starts. And the O's could be operating completely different. Like It's hard to think about because even when Peter Angelos was in charge and the Orioles were spending some money, Right, you can say they didn't spend some of it well. Ubaldo Jimenez, Chris Davis, those contracts didn't exactly work out too well. But they also, you know, gave extensions to Adam Jones and JJ Hardy and kept those guys around and really, really helped this Orioles team. It can go back to that and even more. It's going to go above that. So when you're looking for a pitcher, you're not operating at the Ubaldo Jimenez level, which was still like a solid starting pitcher. It just didn't work out. You're operating at the Blake Snell level. Every offseason, you're potentially operating at the Yamamoto level every offseason, right? And you're not going to get everybody. Not all these rich teams get everybody, although it seems like the Dodgers have literally signed every free agent so far this offseason. Maybe the Dodgers are a pretty good comp 
The Dodgers have an incredible player development system, a great GM. They do a remarkable job over there. What they also have is a couple of guys who own that team, who bought it, who came from the private equity world, which is where these new owners could be coming from. However, they didn't say, oh, we're taking it over like our private equity company. They said, we're taking it over as rich guys who want to make a really good baseball team. And the Dodgers have the best of both worlds. They've got on one side the incredible player development machine. They are amazing at drafting and developing talent. They've also got the side that will shell out the money for Otani and Yamamoto in the same offseason. When those two things come together, it makes an amazing baseball team. And I get it. The Dodgers have only won one championship in this stretch, and it was in the 2020 COVID-shortened season, and people question that championship as well. But to have a Dodgers team that wins the division every single year, and you can count on them to be competitive in the playoffs and have a chance, a legitimate chance to win the World Series every single season, you can't ask for more than that. And at the worst, this turns into the Astros without the skeeting, the, the cheating scandal, the skeeting chandle. Yeah, saying a lot of words tonight. Without the cheating. Because you already have Mike Elias and the Astros' ideas, but you add in, you add in an owner that's willing to spend. And that's what the Astros have kind of had. Jim Crane, their owner, has been willing to spend. And that's why they got Justin Verlander. And they got Garrett Cole. And they've locked up some of their guys like Jose Altuve and Alex Bregman and others. And they've been able to keep together a lot of that team and add outside help to keep them in the ALCS every year and winning World Series. That would be great, too. I'm going to be modeled after either the Astros or the Dodgers, it feels like. This could be amazing. And again, we don't know yet. We don't know if this is going to officially go through. We don't know exactly what everything is going to look like. We don't know when exactly Rubenstein would take over. But all signs are pointing to this isn't a dupe. We haven't been bamboozled or hoodwinked or run amok or led astray or even flat out deceived. This is going to happen this time. All signs are pointing that way. I'm still 1% skeptical because it is the Baltimore Orioles and it is notorious liar John Angelos. But this seems to be happening. And if it does, there's not a lot of ways where this is bad for the Orioles. It seems to be only going in the positive direction. We'll take one more break here. We'll come back. We'll kind of wrap up what's going on here and talk about how we're going to continue to cover this and what this will continue to mean for our beloved and maybe moving into a new era, Baltimore Orioles. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is also brought to you by FanDuel. Now, FanDuel is ready for the Super Bowl. I'm not. This news from today is making me forget all about what happened in the AFC Championship game on Sunday. But it's happy Super Bowl to all who celebrate from FanDuel, America's number one sports book. And if you're like me, Super Bowl Sunday is about scoring the best seat on the couch, grabbing your favorite football snacks, and maybe placing some bets. FanDuel has so many ways for you to end the season with a W or two or three. I'm feeling like a lot of W's right now. Not only can you bet on who will win Super Bowl 58, but also FanDuel has bets for which players will score a touchdown, how many points will be scored, and so much more. And new customers, you can join today. And you'll get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Just visit fanduel.com slash locked on to sign up. That's fanduel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. We're firing all, on all cylinders right here on the Locked On Orioles podcast tonight. Again. If you are just joining us, thank you so much. Tell your friends we are live in the Locked On Orioles podcast. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to the Locked On Orioles YouTube channel. Leave us a rating and a review if you can wherever you listen as well. Thank you so much for supporting the podcast. Thank you to everyone also who reached out directly to me or directly to the pod as soon as this news broke. Again, the news is John O'Ran first reporting from Puck Sports, formerly of Sports Business Journal, reporting that John Angelos is selling the Orioles for an approximate $1.725 billion to Maryland native and very rich billionaire David Rubenstein, along with a group of others. 
Andy Koska of the Baltimore Banner corroborating that report and also reporting that Cal Ripken Jr. is part of this new ownership group. Now, Cal's not going to have like a huge stake. Yes, Cal is rich. Yes, Cal was one of the greatest baseball players of all time. He does not have anything close to David Rubenstein money. That's a good way to put it in perspective, how much money David Rubenstein has. But Cal Ripken Jr., according to Andy Koska of the Banner, is going to be part of this ownership group, which is great news as well to have the local flavor. And there'll probably be more names like that coming out as part of this group, which should certainly excite people in the days to come. But thank you to everyone who reached out. Like, I don't love that hating John Angelos is one of the biggest parts of my brand hosting this podcast. But the amount that, you know, I, I talk about how many stupid things he's done. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's kind of on par that, that that's my thing. And maybe my thing now will be talking about all the good things that could happen with David Rubenstein and the ownership group a part of it. And, and I'm just loving the comments section right now. Like, not able to get to a lot of the questions. There'll be plenty of time in the coming episodes to get to a lot of the questions surrounding this sale and kind of what happens next. And it'll have to be approved by the owners and we'll go from there. And again, it, it won't impact this offseason. We are way too late into the offseason for the Orioles to turn around and sign Blake Snell right now. Like, John Angelos is still in control now. But I will say, like, you know, the steps that led towards this. You have the lease signing in December. You have the Orioles cutting the payroll down to the bare bones. You have the report of David Rubenstein being interested about two months ago. You have the O's not doing anything or spending any money in free agency. You have this really good team with this really low payroll, not a lot of assets you have to buy. You have the Masson dispute getting pretty fairly settled for the last couple of cycles. All of that terrible stuff that was happening with Masson between the Orioles and the Nationals and what the payouts would be. They agreed to most of those numbers over the past year. That was huge. That was probably the biggest roadblock to a potential sale here. And another thing that we've talked about on this podcast multiple times about you know what would need to happen for a sale is that there was a lot of talk that Peter Angelos would have to pass away before any of this could happen. His wish was that when he did pass away, that his sons and his wife would sell the team so they could retire and just kind of sit on all that money and, and live a happy life. Now, John Angelos didn't seem to be really wanting to do that. It seemed like more so Lewis and, and Georgia were a lot more interested maybe in selling the team once Peter passed away. And we don't know if, if that's the case. Like we're, we're still waiting on what's going on in that direction. And we're not wishing any ill will at all on any members of the Angelos family, but that is certainly a, a part of this entire situation as well. But it, it seems like with enough cooperating reporting that, that this has kind of been the day. And yeah, I feel a little vindicated here. Do I feel a little vindicated? I do feel a little vindicated. I feel pretty good about this personally, that this is happening right now. Like, I'm ready. I, I'm ready for John Angelos to to be gone. And, and again, like I, I get the concerns. We got a concern in the comments. Like, could it be worse? It could, right? John Angel is pretty bad at owning a baseball team, but it, it could theoretically be worse. But all signs from David Rubenstein, the fact that he's worth $5 billion, the fact that he spends so much as money, giving it away, philanthropy, you know, spending on the museum, spending on the artifacts, spending on the monuments in DC, helping out museums, helping with history. That, for me, all signs point to he's going to use this Orioles team to pump money into it and try to win a World Series for, this is the biggest part here, David Rubenstein's hometown team. He grew up in Baltimore as an Orioles fan. He wants to give them a World Series, and hopefully he is the guy, along with, hopefully, retaining Mike Elias and that staff to help the Orioles do that at this point. Now, there's so much more to get to, right? There is so much more information to still come out of this. Like there's a lot we do not know at this point. Again, we're about 7.45 p.m. Eastern time on Tuesday night. In between now and the next time you hear from me on this podcast, read the Baltimore Sun, read the Baltimore Banner, read any further reporting John O'Rand has. They're going to be on top of this story, especially the banner. We know the direction that the sun is going. There are still plenty of good journalists at the Baltimore Sun, despite the fact that their owner doesn't want them to be good journalists. There are still some really good journalists at the Baltimore Sun. There are some amazing journalists doing some amazing work at the Baltimore Banner. Read, subscribe, support, especially at the banner right now, local journalism. Check out John O'Ran. Check out at Locked on Orioles on Twitter. I guess we're back. I guess we're back regularly on Twitter, getting ready for this, but is our long national nightmare over? It seems like it. It seems like it's finally come. And you know what? 
Did I get a kick out of all my episodes trashing John Angelos, talking about how terrible of a guy he is, talking about the awful, awful, not just way he ran the Orioles and the team on the field, but the workplace culture he created within both the Orioles and Masson as well? Yeah, I did enjoy talking about that because I wanted it to be known. But you know what else I'm going to enjoy? I'm going to enjoy not talking about John Angelos. I'm going to enjoy him being out of my mind. As soon as this sale is finalized, I am going to enjoy that so, so much. I know it's a Tuesday night. I know many of us have work tomorrow. I know it's pretty cold outside. It's January. And I know the Ravens just lost in a demoralizing AFC championship game. But you know what, Orioles fans? Celebrate. Take a little bit of time to celebrate. We're going to talk more and more about what this all means for the Orioles, what this all means for the team, what the timeline is going to be here. Because again, you know, Rubenstein's not going to step in tomorrow and be like, let's go. We're signing all the players. It's going to take a little while here. And, you know, reporting from Andy Koska and others as well, like here's a, a good thing to, to kind of end this on. Rubenstein and Aragetti, the two main owners, will start off owning about 40% of the team and they will buy Angelos's remaining stake following Peter Angelos's death. So as I mentioned, you know, Peter Angelos's death is kind of uh, one of the last things here that's going to pull this entire story together. But a 40% stake is pretty good. That's still not a controlling stake. So until, until Peter Angelos passes away, John Angelos is still going to be that controlling person. But even though we're at the point here where, yeah, it's not official and there's still some waiting to be done, we're at the point here where something is going to happen. And that is the news that we wanted. And as Matt Kremnitzer said on Twitter, I can't believe John Angelos. I cannot believe John Angelos would sell the team on National Croissant Day. Just ridiculous. But we will take it. Orioles fans, celebrate. And trust me, I'll be back later this week to continue to break it all down. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb. The Orioles, sooner rather than later, will no longer be owned by everyone's least favorite person, John Angelos. And this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, your new ownership team, every day.